Choosing the right yeast for your cider is absolutely critical. That's why we're going to be speaking this week with Anne Flesch, who is both the regional sales manager and technical sales support manager at Fermentis. Hey, 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 my name is Rhea Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. September is Cider Making Preparedness Month, or perhaps you're already in the middle of making some cider. Either way you dice it, it is go time right now, and you can kind of feel it in the air, especially out in all the different special spots of Ciderville, which is why we're going to be talking about a really critical part to making cider, which is all about yeast and how it provides the tool to be able to transform that fresh pressed apple juice into a fermented beverage. And we're going to be having Anne Flesh from Fermentus talking about that. And we're also going to be answering some listener questions that have been sent my way specifically for Anne to answer. So we'll be getting to that shortly. But first, a wee bit of news from Out and About in Ciderville. First off, I want to just say welcome if you are new to the podcast. I probably should have said that earlier because I know that people kind of dial into Cider Chat and like, what is this about? What does it mean? In fact, I was talking to John Bunker and he has a Cider Chat baseball cap and he goes, you know, Rhea, I saw him up at the Apple Camp in Maine. He goes, you know, Rhea, that's my favorite, out of all my hats, that's my favorite hat. People look at that and they think, what does that mean? (laughs) I think that's a compliment. I'll take that as a compliment. I don't know. (laughs) I think he likes because it has an apple in the front and then, you know, cider and chat on either side. But it's like, dude, I hope people know what it means. It's a podcast all about cider and the world affairs of cider and apples and orchard and all the people and their stories. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I digress. What was I talking about? So I, I have this like major focus this fall. And that's what's a little distracting for me. I'm forgetting things like welcoming people to the show, telling you what it's about, and kind of being organized because there's so much going on. I mean, actually, right now, I am in France while this episode 336 is rolling out. And I'm going to be in France for a little while because I'm leading the French Cider Tour to both Normandy and Brittany. And in a couple of days' time, I'm going to be meeting the folks who signed up for this tour and... Uh, yeah. What can I say? <laughs> it's like, pinch me moment, pinch me moment. So that, I got that going on. And then when I return from France, it's full on getting prepared for Cider Days 2.0, which is taking place the first weekend of November. And Cider Chat happens to be both the sponsor and the producer of Cider Days 2.0. So it has been pretty darn busy, but everything's just falling into place in that beautiful, magical apple way where there's so much good cheer. And that's really why I stepped forward to say, okay, I'm going to take this on this year because I wanted to make it feel good. I remember what it was like when I was just getting into this scene nearly 30 years ago and just in awe of the orchardists and the cider makers, which were like kind of like only five, you could count like the number of cider makers that felt like in the whole country on like one hand, maybe two hands. And I was just in awe. And I wanted to bring some of that awe. It's always stayed with me all these years. And I, I can't really say why. It just, it just touched me. I just fell for the apple heart at that point. I don't know why it's kind of like seeing a puppy. I just fell for it <laughs> and wanted to bring that element to Cider Days 2.0. So we have some amazing events taking place. In fact, I mentioned John Bunker earlier, and he will be speaking on Saturday morning, November 5th. The topic is orcharding for homeowners, which I feel is super timely because I see so many trees that are neglected in people's backyards. They might have two beautiful apple trees that were given to them maybe as a housewarming gift, or maybe it was a wedding present. You put it in with a lot of love and care. And then it's like, well, shoot, now this, this tree, it's not bearing any fruit. And then the years go by and the suckers come on. People don't know how to trim it out. They don't know how to take care of it. 
it's kind of like getting a giant dog and not knowing how to take care of it because you were used to tiny little poodles. And believe me, having had a giant dog, I know it's not like having a little poodle. It's not. It's a whole different ball game. And the same can be said with fruit trees. If you don't know how to help them bear fruit, you're going to probably be like, eh, big deal. We don't need that fruit tree back there. And I wanted to bring this workshop forward, ask John to do it. He agreed because it's kind of like the reason why I got involved. I'm sorry, this gets me so emotional. (laughs) It's why I got involved in Cider Days to begin with, because I love trees and I want to help save orchards. I know it sounds like super corny, but it's so freaking true, and uh, I'm sticking with it. So John's going to be doing that on Saturday morning. It's from 9 to 10 in the morning. It's going to be at Hawks and Reeds. On the way in, at at the downstairs level, you get like some coffee. I think there's going to be some breakfast available that you could purchase. Bring it up to the fourth floor and have that wonderful conversation. And then while you're there, stay for the next workshop with Lisa Laird Dunn. She's going to be talking about the history of Applejack. That's just the two morning workshops right there. Talk about two heavy hitters for the first, you know, Saturday since we could start doing workshops like that since a long pause. If you want to see the full and complete schedule, Google Saturdays 2.0. You'll see schedule there or just go to ciderchat.com. Look for the logo Cider, Cider Days 2.0. Click it. It'll bring you into where you can see about the event. You'll see the schedule and you'll see the actual list of events, a larger kind of compilation of what's going on there. And believe me, the events are getting to be continually added on. So bookmark that page because it's going to be kind of your touchstone leading up to that. And if you have never experienced this event, or even if you have, I hope that you will consider joining us this year so we can kind of rally behind each other and kind of help lift ourselves up into the apple trees again. It's kind of like a coming home, like a Mecca for the cider makers, because really this is where it all started to like kick off the modern day cider movement. And if you want to hear more about that, go back to the episode with Judith Maloney from West County Cider really the pioneer, the first commercial cidery in America, and they are based here in my special spot of Ciderville. And of course, Judith will be at Cider Days 2.0. She's one of six women who will be at the cider dinner that evening, that Saturday evening. And you know that's just going to be an event unto itself. I do hope to see you there. Check it out at ciderchat.com or Google Cider Days 2.0. Up next is our featured conversation with Ann Flesh from Fermentus. Ann is both the regional sales manager and technical sales support manager at this international company that helps makers ferment their products. So whether it is kombucha, wine, beer, or cider, they have the yeast for all of us. And in this particular episode, we're going to begin by hearing a bit of what she does, and then we'll be going into the four main cider yeasts that Fermentus offers. Each one has its own letter and numerical number attached to the package. So on the outside, you might see AB1. AB means apple balance. AC4 on another package means apple crisp, AC apple crisp. AS on another package, so they have AS2, and that means apple sweet. And then there's TF6, and that stands for tutti frutti. (laughs) So we're going to go through these different yeasts, discover what they're kind of recommending with that, and I'm going to have some questions. And then we're going to be going to some listener questions that were sent to me a while ago, and Ann will reply with some answers and uh, kind of discovering about what people are doing with cider. So that's what this episode is about. And I feel really good rolling it up because I know a lot of folks really want some of the technical stuff. This is a little bit technical, but I don't know. If you want a primer, if you're trying to get into fermenting, don't be overwhelmed by what we're talking about. I, I know I was in that place at one point where I couldn't like follow what was happening I just had to keep on listening over and over again, maybe hit the the redo button a couple times back to like, oh, what did they say there? 
and not worry about trying to figure it all out at once. So this, get this little dose. It's kind of like getting a little dose of yeast here (laughs) and take it as you can. You're going to be okay. Don't get overwhelmed and say, oh my goodness, I'm listening to this and now I can't make cider because that is not true at all. Anybody, if I can make cider, you can make cider. Believe me, you can make cider. And this is just that technical aspect. Get your glass, sit back, make yourself comfortable or kick it up in the car as you're rolling along. We're going to head now to this conversation with Anne Flesh of Fermentus. I am currently Fermentus Technical Sales Support Manager for the Americas for any type of fruit fermentation. So that include wine and of course cider, specialty beverages, meat, kombucha, and things like this. I was previously the regional sales manager for Western North America, but I'm transitioning in this new position. What I'm doing in this position is really trying to bring as much technical support to the end user, but of course, also the Fermentis team that we have here, two distributors, just try to explain as much as possible what's behind our product, how we recommend, you know, different fermentation solution, bring support for different types of trials, uh, technical trials. I'm on the relay between um, local Fermentis here in in the U.S. and our R&D that we have. Yeast is a huge topic. I mean, it's so integral in terms of converting the sugars into alcohol and doing the fermentation. So it's just like a constant, I want to call it a bit of a craft, but I know it's much more technical and scientific, but it is like a massive, massive uh, topic. Yes. It's it's just fascinating because it's a living organism. And uh, of course, like anything living, it's so complex and the influence of everything you're doing around the yeast and and how it's going to result in your fermentation, the type of yeast that you can choose. I think a lot of people are underestimating the impact of yeast and the choice on their beverage, um, whether it is for, you know, the technical characteristic, the fermentation speed, and, and and more the analytical profile, but also just on the aromas, the mouthfeel of of your cider, for example, and and then all the power that you have on nutrients and temperature and pitching rate and things like this to really drive a yeast to take different direction. It's fascinating. A lot of people may already know we've had for um, quite a while now, we had one yeast for the cider industry called Saf Cider. Um, And obviously, that was just the the first step. Uh, We always wanted to explore and add more options for cider producers uh, to have, I would say, more technical option, more aromatic option to make different styles of cider. So... um, at our R&D center, we went uh, to look at a huge um, a, a collection uh, of yeast, and we went to select from this yeast collection to 20 yeast to then isolating what we thought what were the four best options to propose to cider makers. Um, that's not to be said that we won't add more in the future. I think we, we will. We already have some some good potential there. Uh, but we thought to start with four was a good option. We have four strain. They're all under the Saf Cider umbrella. You will find Saf Cider AB1, AC4, AAS2, and TF6. The AB1 stands for Apple Balance. So Saf Cider Apple Balance 1, and it's called 1 because it was the original one. It's called balance because really uh, this one uh, will not give you an overwhelming aroma. It tends to really let the apple shine, the varietal of the apple that you choose. It tends to lower a little bit the acidity because it can metabolize a little bit the amalic acid that is the main acid in apple juice. If you're looking into that maybe, or you have something a little bit too too tart that you're trying to mellow a little bit or help a malolactic fermentation, that's, that's a good tool. It's a very good fermenter. It, it's very little nit- nitrogen. Um, you can produce any type of cider with that. That being said, uh, it's it, it, it it can it ferments the fructose very well, so it tends to give you, if you let it go dry, it tend, tends to give you a very dry finish. Did you say that it helps with the malolactic fermentation? 
that's also something that I think a lot of people don't know. Yeast have the ability to metabolize the malic acid to some extent, uh, some more than others. For example, AB1 in the portfolio in our staff cider, uh, the one that we lower the malic acid more than most is on the market. And when you lower the malic acid, uh, by definition, it, if you are looking to have a malolactic fermentation, it, it can help start the malolactic fermentation because high concentration of malic can, can prevent malolactic to start. That's a great yeast for somebody like myself who really likes that MLF, malolactic fermentation, that, that profile kind of softens the acids and stuff. So, And at the opposite of the spectrum, you have the AC4. And actually, AC stands for apple crisp. And it's called crisp because it kind of... It's on the other side of the spectrum because it it it, it almost doesn't metabolize aromatic acid. And so if you're looking to make at the opposite something crisp or maybe a late harvest that's already low in acid and you're trying to keep that tartness, um, then that's a good option for you. And then we have the AS2. What does the S stand for there? Well, it's called apple sweet, not because you can only make sweet wine. You can use it to make um, dry or sweet wine. It tends to be very elegant. Uh, it brings a little bit of roundness. It brings some fruit, some floral notes. It's um, it's not overly drying. So in comparison with the AB1 or AC4, that tends to be give you a very dry finish. If if that's uh, if you let it finish fermentation, the AS2 can maybe leave a little bit of, of fructose residual sugar behind and also bring a little bit of mouthfeel through different releasing different compounds in the cider you can make dry cider with a slightly of a less drying finish Mm -hmm. so maybe a cider using the as2 would be something that then if a commercial maker was working with that we might see a semi-sweet on the label it could qualify as, as a dry. I'm just saying, you know, you may always have a little bit of sugar behind. But let's say the ratio of fructose and glucose might be different depending on the yeast. And yeasts that are very fructophilic, like uh, AB1 and AC4, tends to not leave a little bit of fructose behind. And the fructose has a, a stronger sweetening ability. So the less fructose you leave, leave behind for the same and gravity Usually the dryer will be in finish and, and also uh, releasing some manoproteins and things that, like this in the cider might give you around a finish. That being said, AS2 could be used to make sweet cider and to ar- arrest fermentation if, if that's what you wish. Uh, that's definitely an option. It's an easier yeast to arrest than AB1 or AC4 that are very efficient fermenters. Uh, that takes me to the last strain, actually the TF6. And this one uh, stands for Tutti Frutti. We mainly recommend it for sweet cider. It tends to really shine in sweet ciders. You can use it in a dry cider. I would recommend, you know, to to talk to someone at Fermentus or at, at the distributor, anyone who's selling the yeast, uh, because when you use it for dry cider, you know, you have to be a little bit more, just a little bit more caring for the yeast, make sure you don't use too much SO2 and things like this. And it could be a good option for sweet, uh, semi-sweet ciders. It's a really, really good option. Mm, okay. What I'm getting about yeast, you know, as, as long as I've been fermenting, there's always like more to learn about it and more to kind of tweak out. So it, it gives you this like broad range to work with the, the saf cider yeast from Fermentus. With that, if I was going to make something like a sizer, what I classify as a sizer, where I'm adding honey to the juice to ferment, and then I want a yeast that would leave some residual sugars, mm-hmm. would, which one would that be? Because I've used like a sweet mead yeast before for that, but what would work with leaving that like nice fruity sweetness? It wouldn't like go fully dry, but it allows a little bit of the honey and the apple to bounce. What would be one there? I mean, for for yeast that you're trying to harvest naturally, is that what you mean? You don't want the fermentation to... Well, I to... Might, it might be like a pet knot. So I, I, you know, bottle it just before it's kind of like finishing. So I get like those nice little elegant bubbles. TF6 seems that it could be, you know, a great option for that. AS2 could also be a good option. I think both would probably uh, give you that nicer 
fruity finish that you're looking for. They would also be easier to stop in their fermentation in their course, just because naturally they have a slower fermentation, um, and especially TF6. And you can more easily manage them with temperature. Their higher sensitivity to temperature, SO2, low nutrients, make them better candidates for fermentation. We're trying to leave a lot of residual sugar behind. Plus, they do bring this fruitiness that might fit the style that you're looking for. Nice. Good. So I'm I'm looking at my handy dandy little saf cider. Oh, yeah. I have my little folder here. It has on the bottom the different strains that we're talking about here. And then it talks about genetics and fermentation behavior. It says underneath the genetics and for each of these strains of yeast, it says the killer factor. And it mm-hmm. says neutral for the TF6, and then the AC4 is a killer, and then the AS2 is a sensitive, and the AB1 is a sensitive. What are we talking about there uh, specifically? Is that having to do with the wild yeast, uh, or what, what's going on there? Yeast can be classified um, in three different categories, and you kind of uh, told about what the what this, the categories are. If they are killer, that means they they are able to produce some toxins that may be able to affect other microorganisms or the yeast, and therefore tend to make them more able to implant very well, control the fermentation. So thank you. I'm looking for my words here. Killer yeast historically or typically can really implant very well and dominate very quickly. Uh, that being said, it doesn't mean that other yeast that are not killer cannot implant very well. We have plenty of example of yeast that ferment is, and AB1 is one that are actually uh, se- uh, sensitive. And that means that at the opposite of the spectrum, they cannot produce uh, such molecule, but they can be sensitive to the ones that other yeast can produce. For example, AB1 is sensitive, but we have seen that it implants very well. I know we talk a lot about killer factor. It's not that black and white. And neutral means they're, they're either sensitive or producing killer factor. So they're in the middle. If you have issues with implantation of your yeast in your fermentation, definitely try to look rather for a killer yeast. It gives you more chances. That being said, again, a yeast that is not um, uh, killer doesn't mean that it won't implant well. Um, we do recommend for people that do co-inoculation or sequential inoculation to be careful about this, though, especially in commercial yeast, to not... Uh, choose one that is uh, killer first that could then potentially prevent the other one to implant well. Um, This is something to consider. So what you're talking about there is when somebody is uh, producing a cider and they're doing multiple uh, processes where they're adding a number of different yeasts through that process to be uh, maybe not go with the AC4 for the first one. For example, some people like to co-inoculate together. They choose one because they like this aromatic profile, but the other one is a very good fermenter. So some people like to do that. Um, It's becoming, you know, something that a lot of people start doing in the wine industry, in the brewing industry. Um, I've heard some people doing it in the cider industry for sure. Uh, And in that case, you know, maybe inoculating, I don't know, um, sensitive with killer could could result in in the killer over dominating um but again it's not always a given we've seen plenty of example where yeah a sensitive one has uh, really implanted it could be aggressive too the sensitive could be aggressive so watch out there folks (laughs) I think this is good. I mean, you know, it gives us a range. You know, nothing is kind of like rock solid because what will happen in one cider house can be totally different in another place. And there's so many different factors involved. And to look at this chart as a guide, not, you know, set in stone because it will, you know, depending on your skill too. And this chart uh, has a lot of information. So, yes, there are some things that if you don't understand what something means, you should feel free to reach out um, to anyone at Fermentus and they can they can help you understand what it means and how it can affect you or in, in your choice of yeast. I cannot say that I'm authority on yeast at all, but folks are always asking Saccharomyces this, Saccharomyces that. And so what is like the dominant taxonomy that you're using for the cider strain? And what does that really mean? The four yeast that we have 
in our portfolio as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is the most popular uh, species used in fermentation. There used to be a category uh, that used to be called Saccharomyces bianus or Saccharomyces cerevisiae var bianus, but taxonomy evolves all the time. Now you would say most yeast that used to be called Saccharomyces bianus are now uh, reclassified as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They do have some phenotype uh, that seem that they appear to be Saccharomyces bianus. They can uh, ferment at low temperature. They're very resistant. But with the evolution of science, uh, we now know that they are part of, of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So people that used to say, I want a uh, bianus, a champagne strain, because they're very resistant, you're right. Uh, there are plenty of strains that can ferment at low temperature, handle low nutrients, give you this very dry finish. But now fermenters and must supplier on the industry categorize them as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And sometimes you can call them ex bianus because people still know them as bianus. There are other type of species in, in the Saccharomyces um, genera. So you can have, for example, uh, Saccharomyces pastorianus that are known as the, the category of the lager strains. Some people can use them in the cider industry. They can, you know, I've, I've heard example of some uh, lager strain that can give you some very interesting floral um, uh, type of cider uh, fermented at low temperature. So you can always experiment outside of, you know, the portfolio that's given. Uh, that being said, I would say most of the yeast that are offered for the cider industry uh, are Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I don't know if that answers the question, Dix and so on. Got it. With ice cider, which is like ice wine, Mm -hmm. that's where someone has, uh, they've done like a freezing of the juice, just for listeners who are kind of tuning into this, you freeze the apple juice before you mm -hmm. ferment it. And so you pull off the water and now you have very condensed apple juice, very high in sugar. And then that is fermented. And I hear often from makers, they're like, wow, that is still chugging along. And there's still a little bit of air in the airlock, but it just does not seem like it's going to... Ferment dry. Right. And mm. so is there a particular yeast in this complement, or does that bring you into like another yeast strain? Because that's a big interest for people. And I know I'm throwing this at you today, but... Uh, I would say the reason why uh, most strains that are used in the fermentation world or Saccharomyces cerevisiae is because they have a very high, a good fermentability. You can push them in alcohol. Uh, they don't. So a lot of um, uh, other species in the Saccharomyces uh, maybe uh, you, you can push them as, as high in alcohol. Um, other yeast outside of the Saccharomyces, uh, the non-Saccharomyces means all the other yeast, most of the time won't be able to ferment high up in alcohol. That means that maybe the they can ferment a little bit, a few, you know, a few, few percent or less, but then eventually they'll stop fermenting and then you'll have a stuck fermentation or fermentation you have to restart. So uh, people use uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae because they have the qualities that you're looking for into, um, into the main job that they have to do, which is <laughs> producing alcohol from sugar um and but in in the in the saccharomyces cerevisiae group you have a very large diversity of um technical characteristics aromatic characteristics and so on i, I figure no, you might know that's a great question and i think you kind of can group that also with high gravity um cider um so I would say just cider that starts with very high concentration of sugar and what are the problematics around that? Um, so definitely, so um, ice cider, you concentrate the sugar that are naturally present there by removing water. In some other options, some people may add additional sources of sugar uh, from, you know, it could be raw sugar, it could be from honey, it could be, you know, you can do a lot of, different type of hybrids. You can also start from uh, uh, apple juice concentrate and then dilute to what you want. So you start with potentially a lot of sugar. In all these situations, what you have in common is that potentially you have a lot of sugar 
you might have lost or you started with very low um, nutrients for your yeast too. So you start with a lot of sugar to ferment without giving to your yeast a lot of things to work with. Um, so what you're looking for is a yeast that is very resistant, that can ferment very high in alcohol, that can uh, that that doesn't need a lot of nutrients to do it. Uh, so for example, um, the one I recommend uh, first would be the South Cider AB1. It's a very resistant yeast. Uh, in, in that regard, the AC4 is also a good choice. Uh, I would definitely, for example, not recommend the TF6 uh, for that one, uh, the opposite. Um, then something that you also want to think of is, do, does, does the yeast have enough nutrients, enough nitrogen, enough vitamins um, uh, in order to ferment this amount of sugar? So it's kind of like a race. Uh, if you ferment to 5% ABV, uh, you don't need, or if you run a half marathon, you don't need to eat uh, the same amount of food than if you eat a marathon. Um, if, you, if you're going to run a marathon, you need, you need more. So you always need to consider the concentration of sugar in how much nutrient to add. Do I have enough? Um, I know a lot of cider maker, uh, if, if you ferment, uh, if, if you do a, a sweet cider and you stop at 5% ABV, um, you may have enough nutrients in the apple juice for that, depending, again, on the apple, on the growing condition, on the process. Uh, you may or you may not. But most likely, if you start going in 8%, 10% and above, you will need to add some type of meditation aids. Uh, we, we qualify them as fermentation aid at Fermentus because um, at least in, in, in our portfolio, our fermentation aids, some of them provide um, nitrogen, uh, what we call organic nitrogen uh, that comes from the yeast. So uh, that could be amino acids, small peptides, things like this. Um, but also vitamins, um, uh, different survival factors uh, that come from uh, the the yeast uh, yeast hulls the envelope of the yeast that can provide some lipids some sterols all the things that the yeast needs to ferment um, are you ca are you calling that vitamins or v vitamins oh Is you know what I, I know in British English uh, that's vitamins. okay I just I just want to make sure we're we're talking about the same thing here yes 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 so vitamins I think I say both. <laughs> okay, so vitamins, vitamins. For, for the Americans and vitamins for the the Brits, and we know both are listening, so we want to welcome everyone here. Of course, I'm not I'm not from Britain, so I don't I know. know. Yeah. Uh, you're from France, okay. is that true? Yes, yes, yes. but actually. In France, we say vitamins, so that maybe is the reason why I vitamins. choose the vitamins. Okay, <laughs> well, I mean, look, I bow down to you. You're, you're bilingual, and, and I'm working on it. So, you know, yeah. thank you for your intelligence there and going with this. You were talking about, um, so they, they would look at some kind of fermentation aid in conjunction with that yeast that they've used to kind of keep on working it along the process. And that could be added throughout the fermentation. The best time to add fermentation aid is really uh, before half of the fermentation. So, um, you know, for example, if you are not lacking too much nitrogen, if you have enough to start with, a good time to add it is, for example, at one third of the fermentation in terms of depletion of sugar. Uh, but if you have to add a lot and you start, you know, you always have to, ideally, you know what's in your juice in terms of uh, yeast uh, available nitrogen. Uh, and if, if you need to add a lot, of course, you're going to have to break that down into, into small addition between uh, inoculation and half of the fermentation. Um, but yeah, we can help you with protocols for sure. Uh, I think it all depends. Um, you know, at the beginning, if you're really lacking nitrogen, we recommend to do an addition at inoculation and then one at one third, for mm -hmm. example. How for folks who aren't commercial makers here and listening, how did how does one measure the nitrogen in the juice? Yeah, so that's that's pretty hard to do at home if you yeah. have no equipment. I know some laboratory would do that for you. I'm not sure how much it makes sense, you know, financially. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a cider at home and it's a hobby and uh, and it's a small batch, you know, maybe the best assumption is to assume you have very low amount and maybe add a little bit too much, even though I wouldn't recommend adding 
too, too much, but maybe you just want to secure your fermentation and consider, um, you know, I probably have less than 50 ppm uh, and, and assume that you're going to need, you know, to add um, uh, at least 100 ppm of, of uh, nitrogen uh, under the form of yeast derived nutrients, or for example, diammonium phosphate, uh, you can use both in combination is a good idea. Mm -hmm. If you need to add a lot of nitrogen, uh, I don't recommend to do it only with yeast derived products. Uh, I recommend to do yeast derived products and then, um, diammonium phosphate that will give you some, uh, mineral sources of nitrogen, um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, so to answer the question, if, if, you, if you're not doing it commercially, uh, you know, you have to do some uh, enzymatic assay and you need, you need equipment um, to do that. So you can, if you're really interested, you can always look for um, a laboratory that, that would mm -hmm. do it. For you. If you need mm -hmm. recommendations, feel free to reach out. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. yeah, I don't think it's something that you can easily do at home. Either. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. And you have this little equipment that now you can you can buy and you can order the little kits online. Mm -hmm. They're not the the. I 100%, mean, percent, yeah. Small cidery that could be a very good option mm -hmm. now for a hobby, unless mm -hmm. unless your that's where your money goes. And, Maybe not worth it. Well, we have a recommendation for somebody um, uh, in the U.S. that we'll recommend at the uh, in the show notes to this, who does sure. does a little bit of uh, analysis of uh, juice and the apples. Yeah. It's a great thing, you know, for us super geeks. We love that. Just to come back to um, helping with fermentation with high gravity, I just wanted to add a few things. Um, that yeast really answer to a combination of factor together. So. There is never a set limit to how far you can push a yeast, but the more gentle you are with a yeast, the more likely you're going to push it further. So um, don't be extreme in temperature, either too low or too high. Uh, have a nice nutrient program. Uh, make sure that you didn't over clarify your juice, that there is enough, enough turbidity for your yeast. All these things together make that you can always push a yeast. You know, there is always a limit. We say this yeast goes to 18%, this yeast goes to 9% uh, ABV, but really, if you are gentle and taking care of a yeast and making sure that looking at the technical data sheet, you are really staying in the range of the recommendation and, and you can always push it a little bit further. Mm -hmm. I love those tips. Be gentle, uh, avoid extreme temps and have a nice nutrient program and build that into your, your uh, process, whether you're commercial or not. I think that's wonderful. Fantastic. So the four sap cider yeasts, we went over, uh, we could go more on that, but I think we'll save that for another conversation. I had some listener questions here that I've been holding on to for a while, and I'd like to get into that. I'm going to read the first one here and kind of uh, just uh, go through it. Yeah. So the first one uh, came to me and it was asking me, but I'm going to be asking you, Anne, uh, in all your cider making experience and travels, have you heard of anyone using a hybrid approach? And I think here they're talking about wild yeast and uh, then a inoculation of a cultured yeast from Fermentis. And they're asking they believe it's worth trying because the culture yeast will clean up any funkiness left behind by their wild counterparts. Now, before you answer that, I know that this, you know, in cider making, there's kind of like almost like a mystique, you know, and a magicalness, and you want to let the, the potion do its thing in a way. I have to admit, I'm like one of those people that believe in that magic. But I know that there's a science here, and I am seeing more and more with many makers where they'll, they'll have the juice. Maybe it's a matter of timing, but it, it is just kind of going its own way. It's, there's no sulfiding or anything. It's just letting the wild ambient yeast in the room, uh, you know, on the apples, on the pressing equipment go, and then adding a cultured yeast. So for first, is there a name for that uh, process? And are you seeing this more? And what's your advice on this? Um, um, yes. So for sure, there are some truth to that myth, and you know it doesn't come from from nowhere. And of course, there is also science behind. Now, I don't have a word for the ivory technique where you start with native and then you inoculate. Uh, I would say, you know, you have native fermentation, 
um, where the yeasts can come from. It can come from anywhere. It, you know, the, the yeast, the yeast come from the fruit, they come from the cidery, they come from the equipment, they come from the air, they come from you. Um, so they come from, from everywhere. Um, I don't know if there is a, a really a, a word to say that approach where you start with native and then you inoculate. For sure, using the native yeast can bring you a lot of benefits. They can bring you uh what we call usually complexity, uh, whether there are non-saccharomyces yeasts or saccharomyces yeast, uh, wild yeast, um, uh, can produce uh, a lot of esters. They really can promote some varietal uh, components from your apple. And so a lot of people like to do native fermentation for this reason, because it tends to give them a cider that is that has more layers, that is more complex, that has uh, uh, that is different from other someone else cider. Let's put it that way. Um, that has more dimensions, maybe more roundness, more aromas. That being said, when you do that, you always take some risks. You're usually going to have not one yeast. You're going to have you know different yeasts uh, that are going to be there and work together. Uh, one of the risks is that the one that tends to overpower, cannot really reach high alcohol, then you're going to have a stuck fermentation. All these yeasts are going to need nitrogen and vitamins. Uh, they're going to utilize all these nitrogen and vitamins and then not leaving a lot behind for mm -hmm. potentially a yeast that you will inoculate. That's, a, mm -hmm. that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it will bring you something that will also take something for the rest of the fermentation. The risk is that they can also bring you off flavors. Uh, like, you know, you were talking about funky uh, sulfur of notes, maybe acetic acid, you know, depending on, on the type of yeast. I don't think the notion that the yeast that you inoculate will clean that up is completely accurate. I think doing that is definitely an option. Start native, then inoculate with a very strong yeast uh, to finish up. Some people do that. Um, it's the same science that's behind the sequential inoculation of, of different yeast. Just so you know, you take you, you take risk. Uh, you need to make sure that if you do something like this, you know, you have enough enough nitrogen. That means that you have to go a little bit overboard with the nitrogen that you need to add to finish fermentation. The risk is that the yeast that you inoculate, uh, that there is too much competition, that the yeast cannot really implant very well, and then you have a stuck ferment, and then you have to do this things so mm -hmm. i would say for people that do it and that do it well and have a lot of control on their process it's it's wonderful i have a lot of friends that do these kind of things uh, for example on uh, on wine you do need to feel like you you, know, you have a lot of control on your mm -hmm. process to start doing these things and that mm -hmm. you you know the science behind it and you know what to do if things starts to go wrong mm -hmm. if it's having a flavor you need to react really quickly and just don't let it go until you run uh, into a stuck fermentation that's impossible to restart. That's good advice. I think if anyone's going to do it, it's it's knowing your juice and knowing your, you know, it, maybe working with your wild yeast a bit to kind of get a sense of what's going on. And taste taste every every day, you yeah. know. And when you things when things start to potentially go wrong, act act quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the best tip right there. Taste every day and act quickly. Really good. All right, well, let's go on to this uh, second question here that we have. And this was kind of interesting. Um, this was a person who says that they're unable to drink alcohol, but they're getting better, and they, they want to explore some options for occasional small servings of cider. And they have worked with Seth Cider, Saccharomyces baianus, but we would say Cervesi. Cerve but Saccharomyces. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, but they asked about a different, a different version here that I'm not familiar with, but it, which is Saccharomyces boulardii. Do you know what they're talking about there? Because this must be some kind of like sensitivity, yes. food sensitivity. Saccharomyces boulardii is actually classified as Saccharomyces cerevisiae var 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 bouillardi so it's it's part of saccharomyces cerevisiae i know uh at fermentis we don't carry uh this yeast i know at uh, at losaf in a division that deals with human health they do sell uh saccharomyces cerevisiae var for uh as a as an ingredient for food supplement uh, and I think it's there is a lot of science behind it that it helps 
uh, with the microflora of the digestive system against inflammation. Uh, I think there is a lot of research behind it. Unfortunately, I'm not, you know, it's it's not, um, I, I don't know a lot about it. I, I, I do know friends that actually take supplements that have uh, Bullardi in them. Um, so I think there is a lot to say about the benefits of this. Mm-hmm. I do not know anything about using this strain uh, in terms of fermentation. Mm-hmm. Is it able to ferment? Uh, to what level? Um, I, to be honest, I don't know much. I don't mm-hmm. think anyone. I don't know anyone was used this to ferment. I don't think you could make any claim of health on a fermented product either so here we're talking about someone who's doing this at home what i would recommend is to eat this in a in a food supplement it's, right. it, I, I think there is a lot of benefit for it unfortunately i do not know anything about the ability of bullardi to ferment uh and would there be in a, even benefit from in the product from that yeast in the lease i I wouldn't be able to say. Mm, mm, yeah. So that seems like that's something like a good home project. See what happens. Um, but this would be like a probiotic that you would take like as a little capsule, you know, it, capsule. And then there is a lot of, of probiotics on the market. Mm-hmm. You know, if you type mm-hmm. Blurdy, you'll find a lot of products mm-hmm. on the market that could mm-hmm. contain this. That being said, I don't recommend to add the supplement to your, uh, they might not be a live yeast. I, I, they might be inactivated yeast. I, That's right. To be honest, I'm not really sure, so I'd rather not make any mm-hmm. recommendation um, mm-hmm. of doing that. I, w- I would keep them separate, uh, but, yeah. you know, it's a good idea to add some more more health to what we're already drinking. (laughs) Right. Well, I think that's kind of like the fun, you know, people get into like adding all different kinds of things and, you know, go for it. Why not, you know, try it. But uh, there you have it. Um, Not something that they offer as a yeast strain for Mm -hmm. fermenting. So our third question here is about the timing of inoculation for malolactic bacteria in cider and how, it influences influences the um, malolactic fermentation. Malolactic bacteria is what you're working with to go for MLF, malolactic fermentation, which provides a certain softness to the cider. Not everybody likes this. Uh, I I enjoy it also. Of course, I I love it too. But um, what is the timing process? You you talked a little bit about this in terms of. Uh, adding vitamins and nutrients early on. But how about the MLB, the malolactic bacteria? What's your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, for sure. I'd love to answer. I'd just like to start to say that um, at Fermentis, we currently don't don't carry any offer of uh, malolactic bacteria for for cider, you know, um, may, maybe in the future. So I would say any any put that I have here is more for uh, from what I know about the topic. Um, let me start with a question for you, Ria. You said you love malolactic fermentation. So yeah. when do you perform your malolactic fermentation? Do you inoculate? It just happens. Uh, it just happens for me. Um, okay. So I've never done it on purpose. You know, I've I've done some barrel aging, and if I've you know, it's worked. It just okay. worked that way, but I've never actually tried to introduce anything, so it occurs naturally. Post alcoholic fermentation during aging before bottling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there are definitely different times that people are considering doing the malolactic fermentation. Some people like to do it. Uh, I think most currently people are doing post alcoholic fermentation. Uh, I know that in France, um, a lot of producer producer actually perform the malolactic fermentation in bottle. I would say most people, I would say in the U.S. probably do it uh, before bottling post-alcoholic fermentation. There is this trend to do co-inoculation or co-fermentation, alcoholic fermentation and malolactic fermentation at the same time. There are pros and cons of doing everything. Safest option is to do after the alcoholic fermentation mm-hmm. uh, and usually like for yourself if you if you age in barrel you know that could happen naturally don't choose a yeast that produce too much SO2 too because mm-hmm. that could prevent the go. start of MLF mm-hmm. um, a pH is a big driver do have the tools to to drive the speed of the malolactic fermentation you can inoculate with a commercial bacteria 
something to consider is that, uh, especially if you don't have a good nutrition program and you start with low nitrogen, especially low amino nitrogen to start with, the yeast might util have utilized all the nitrogen and there is nothing left for the bacteria. So if that's the case, you can use a yeast derived um, nutrient, feed them with the bacteria to help at a very low dosage. Uh, you don't want to use that because bacteria cannot cannot use uh, that, that source of nitrogen. So you want to use yeast totalized, for example, spring firm, spring firm extreme that we have at Fermentis or something equivalent. Just want to make sure people heard that. So Anne's saying don't use DAP which is yeah. kind of a pretty well-known yeah. additive. Yeah, that so one. you can use that uh, for, to help with alcoholic fermentation, ideally in combination with um, a yeast totalized like spring from spring from extreme, but mm -hmm. for bacteria, uh, privilege uh, a yeast-derived nutrient uh, mm -hmm. because bacteria uh, are going to use especially amino acid and small peptides uh, as a source of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So if you have no more nitrogen that could prevent the bacteria to to grow and, and do its job, um, I, I'm not sure if I'm asking us the timing. So it's it yeah. really depends well, well, on well, the alcohol fermentation, but there is a risk for that if you have right. competition between the bacteria and the yeast for the nutrients, then you might end up with a stuck alcoholic fermentation uh, in the sake of speeding up the malolactic fermentation. Mm -hmm. Of things you can do, things you cannot do. Yeah, but. I know. Isn't that the way it goes with cider? There's all these different things that you could do, and it's it's like a big science project. And it really, I think, in the end, maybe the best advice is to kind of lay out your path before you start. You begin, and that's why I wanted to have this conversation with you today to get it out there at this time in the fall, where people are really planning their cider production now to get their their yeast order to get that lined up and to think about from the beginning to the end what kind of cider they want to have when it's going into the bottle. A native fermentation with wild yeast, yeah. you know, great. I think you you're it's it could be a great idea and you're very brave. Just always have a a, a yeast I mean, uh, on on your shelf, you know, in case something go wrong as to be ready for that. Um, uh, totally. But to have a pack of nutrients and a pack of yeast, and and that 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 you think is a good is a good option. Uh, for example, if you're doing native. Yeah, I I love that. You know, that's such good advice. Always have a package of yeast on your shelf and the nutrients. That is fantastic. In fact, that's a great present for people. If you want to gift a cider maker something, give them a collection of like the Saf cider. You know, just to have like a, a not just one package, but the whole range. And that way, you know, if something gets stuck or something's not going as planned, boom, you don't have to like worry about that shipping time or anything. It's right there. Fantastic. Exactly. Well, this has been such a pleasure talking with you. I hope we could do it again. Thank you for having me. Thank you so very much. Have a great day. Well, I learned a lot in that conversation and kind of like helped me feel like I actually knew something. <laughs> Because it could be a little overwhelming, like I said earlier. You know, I've been in this for a while, and still I could kind of be a little baffled. And maybe it's just kind of the human condition where we make things more complicated than we need to. When we have folks like Anne and a place like Fermentis doing their work, we could kind of rely on them for those decisions that could really be like way out of my wheelhouse. I'm going to lean on them. So thanks again, Anne. That was awesome. And Check it out at Fermentis.com. Go there, look at their website, and you'll be able to see the four Saf cider yeast that we were talking about. Walk into the orchards. I'd like to thank the fine patrons of this year's podcast who helped keep this podcast rolling out each week, every year for the past seven years, which is absolutely phenomenal. The following commercial cider makers are supporting Cider Chat at the Cider Going Up level at the Cider Chat Patreon page. And that is Ross on Y Cider and Perry Company. They just had the Ross Cider Fest take place at Ross and Y in England. And that's been going on almost n nearly as long as Cider Days. An amazing event. I'm really happy to see it took place and um kind of bummed I wasn't there, but you know, there's always next year. And then also the fine folks at Duck Chicken Cider in London. That's James and Colleen. They're doing some amazing cider and perry right in their South London flat. Amazing, amazing stuff. 
Then Space Time Mead and Cider Works based in Dunmore, Pennsylvania. Award-winning mead and cider and wine there. I look forward to seeing Dan on the French Cider Tour coming up. So you know, that guy is doing something good. Outstanding, outstanding place and a wonderful site. Then there's Insider Japan, Japan's first and only bilingual magazine dedicated to all things cider. Esoterra Cider is based in Dolores, Colorado. So that is around the Four Corners region in the U.S. of A. If you haven't followed them yet on Instagram, do. They're always having amazing events and you could tell they have quality cider. There's Taddy Bogle Cider Works in Acme, Pennsylvania. So that is southwestern Pennsylvania, only 45 minutes out of Pittsburgh. A beautiful site overlooking the the valley below. Uh, really friendly folks. A cool place. Shoot, bring your horse and tie it up to the hitching post. Olympic Bluff Cidery in Washington State. Scott and Ginger of Oak Bluff Cidery have been doing some amazing work at this new cidery that's come online more recently. If you are lucky enough to be in the Pacific Northwest, you definitely want to go to Olympic Bluffs Cidery. And the American Cider Association, which is the national trade organization for cider, helping keep everyone up to date and helping to move legislation forward to support the cider industry. A big tip of the hat to all that they do at the American Cider Association. If you are not a member, I want to recommend that you do that today. They are helping commercial makers, they're helping startups, and they even have a level for cider enthusiasts. That's the ACA, the American Cider Association. You too can become a patron by joining these commercial cider makers and more at the Cider Chat Patreon page. Just Google Patreon. It's spelled P-A-T. R-E-O-N. And with that, I leave you here. This is Real in Color, signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. We love orchards. And having fun, there is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason reason why we drink it like this. this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider. We like palms, we We like orchards, having some fun. There is a reason, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is, there is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes there is, there is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet, oh yeah. We, we like cider. Oh yes we do. We like palms. Oh yes we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. We we like palms. Oh yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeehaw!